what does gender have to do with nationalism? This might have been the first question that came to your mind when you read the title of my presentation. Um, well, I'm Maya, I study international relations and sociology, and today I'm going to try to answer this question with you. So first of all, we need to understand what nationalism is. Yeah. Uh, so it can be defined as a feeling of loyalty, devotion and affiliation that we have for our own country and its culture. And this encompasses traditions, sentiments, beliefs, which in such an extent that our nationality becomes to us a very strong identifier. Ever since the rise of the nation state, nationalism has been represented as a gender concept. The entity of the nation state emerged in the 17th century within male dominated social structures and institutions, which still exist today and still carry inside symbolic inequality. This is relevant today uh, because think, for example, of the event of a woman becoming president or prime minister, which is still perceived as something surprising or something that is worth celebrating. Um, well, that's precisely the reason why today I want to look at nationhood using a feminist lens. And I'd like to address sociolinguistics and how gender is constructed within nationalist discourse. Then I'm going to look at history and um, the gendered manifestations of nationalism in the 20th century authoritarian regimes. And finally, at the gendered manifestations of nationalism in contemporary politics. Uh, before I start, I'd like to point out that due to the cultural heterogeneity of nationalisms outside the West, this analysis is going to be focused on Western nationalism. So let's begin by thinking of the gendering of language in relation to nationhood. We can notice that the term nation itself is feminine in most grammatical gender languages. And what's more, the iconography of the nation always resorts to female personifications. You might wonder why, and there is a reason for this. The reason being that allegorically, nations are to their citizenry what women are to men, so entities of the domestic sphere need of love and protection. The atavistic component of society is bestowed upon women who are seen as um, both biological and cultural reproducers. And this is conveyed through the idea of motherland, um, by which the nation becomes a mother and a woman to be defended. One might argue that there is a fatherland as well. However, this concept carries with it male-oriented and war-related notions of nationhood. And it's no coincidence that from the Greek pater, father, comes patriotism, which is the heroic exaltation of nationalist sentiments. Now another question arises, which is, why is nationalist jargon family-related? Well, the pre-nationalist society was a family-based one. What this means is that um, in the 17th before the 17th century, the most important social unit was not the country as we understand it to be today, but the family. So uh, that century signified a shift from a culture of affiliation, which means the culture of having children, towards a culture of affiliation, which means the culture of adopting children, representing the act of becoming connected to each other um, through a relationship of shared identity. Hence the conceptualization of the nation as the family of men, projecting the father's hegemonic role within family structures onto broader social structures, namely that of the nation. The universal recognition of men's dominance in society can be represented through a set of attributes typically agreed to be masculine, such as strength, leadership, assertiveness, uh, courage, and most importantly, violence. This makes the national fight a strictly male duty, and by opposition, housework and f care for the family, for example, strictly female prerogatives. Um, such a polarizing view of society can be observed, especially in the 20th century dictatorships, and especially during war times, because that's when labor was most clearly divided along the lines of gender. For example, under the Nazi regime, nationalism became a male spectacle of leadership, courage, military virtue, and men were always portrayed as soldiers, as warriors, as defenders of the nation by government-promoted organizations such as the Hitler Youth and the German Students League, as we can see in this poster. 
And likewise, Mussolini's Italy greatly relied on the physical and moral training of the national youth through the Balilla institution. The ideal of the new man, who had to be powerful, disciplined and loyal to the state, represented a very um, hyper-masculine narrative which was extended to imperialistic propaganda. In fact, this poster which reads, um, Italy finally has its own empire, mm, shows the image of a man at work to embody the imperialistic strife for power. And finally, Franco Spain was built on the three pillars of Dios, Patria, Yugar, which means God, the nation and home, expressing a fierce devotion to the idea of a Spanish nation embedded in Catholicism. Um, here the centrality of gender roles intersects with the model of the Catholic family by which the ideal woman had to be submissive, obedient to the church and to her husband and devoted to her, the family and her children. Paradoxically, as women were relegated to housework and family chores, sexualized female figures held sway over propaganda as a metaphor of the nation itself. And this shaped a model of nationalism which was, um, which was intended for the male gaze, by which men became the subjects and the protagonists of the um, national fight, and women, on the other hand, became its object because they were marginalized in real life politics and they were reduced to an image which was only for men to see. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Today, surprise, surprise, gender is still a form of social cleavage. It sits at the basis of society and it produces inevitable influences on our culture and on our politics. Um, my case study will be the discourse of the right wing in Western politics. For example, in 2016, sexism and nationalism were found to be the most uh, suitable variables to predict the electoral outcomes in the US uh, because they were always closely connected in Trump's um, outwardly sexist rhetoric. And here's an example. And concurrently, Concurrently, um, anti-feminist manifestations of nationalism have been on the surge in Europe. The case studies here will be Italy and France. So in Italy, former Prime Minister um, Silvio Berlusconi has consistently established the gendered boundaries of politics through his misogynistic speech and actions. His case is very topical today because he was just found not guilty by the Italian Supreme Court after being sentenced to prison multiple times and after being banned from public office for engaging in child prostitution. Um, and he's still a senator in the current government, which is ironically presided by a woman, Giorgia Meloni, the one who's pointed out by the big arrow. Although women only make up 24% of it, so that's six women out of 25 people. This leads us into the topic of political masculinity. In France, Marine Le Pen's masculine political persona similarly allowed her as a woman to repropose the same conservative values by which women should be content with their domestic maternal roles. And this makes us think about how oftentimes women in office, the charisma of women in office is linked to their political masculinity which reiterates the argument that women can have strong leadership in spite of being women and not as women and just as capable of political virtue as men. So I think that at this point we can safely state that um, sexism and nationalism are both deeply rooted in a culture of hegemonic masculinity and although divisive notions of nationalism were more explicit in the past, they are still present in our society nowadays. So acknowledging and challenging the gender bias that permeates our language, our, col our culture, our uh, society and our politics is key to build a fairer future where all voices are equally heard. And I believe that this is an, an objective that's as close as ever today as more and more people are engaging in politics and activism. And um, yeah, so thank you for listening. Yeah.